Right, we're into it. What's your risk? Well, 32 years I've been um, a medical doctor. Um, did my training in Otago. Used to come here and uh, surf a lot around uh, Kakanui and Campbell's Bay. So I know, know the area well. Um, in that time I've seen a lot of death, uh, a lot of disease, um, a lot of self-harm, and uh, whether it was vodka or other things. And, uh, but most of it's preventable, right? And, and I often reflect, like, you know, I'm here for 45 minutes. I left Great Barrier Island yesterday morning. I did 48 hours as a GP, you know, a few, few planes and get here. I'm thinking, why am I doing this? I thought, well, I reckon I can save more lives by doing this than I can by working um, in the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff at the emergency department or we're calling rescue helicopters or working in one. So look, I was reflecting, and it's probably too small to see this, I know, but 2001 that is, if you can't read, 29th of May, so just don't have long with that, that is, you know, um, 21 years ago, I had an internet company, Dr Global, and we, we partnered with fencepost.com, don't know what happened to Fencepost, but um, probably uh, washed away or something, but yeah, we were, I've been in this rural space for at least 21 years, and we were, you know, I was trying to add resources and talk to rural communities, because um, I love rural, and uh, I was living in Taranaki at the time, surrounded by dairy farms down the coast um, in Okato. So my big message today is like health is safety and New Zealanders are 15 more times more likely to die from a work-related illness than a workplace accident. And we focus on safety, 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 but it's not health and safety, health is safety, right? And um, so when I look at, you know, all the accidents, and I don't, there's no such thing really as an accident, um, you know, on a farm, it's like when you look at what was going on, you know, he was rushing to this and he was late and he didn't see this. And, you know, there's all these things that, that contribute to it, right? And mental health is a big, a big part of that. So some of these slides are a little bit confronting to get your attention, but um, and I apologise because you might have someone in hospital that um, has got a scan like this. My sister-in-law was in hospital last night trying to get a CT scan, um, you know, waiting in a corridor for like eight hours, you know. And um, but I can't change the past, but what we can change is the future. And what I'm trying to do is stop you ending up um, being like one of these patients. So here's a, you know, a farmer working in the emergency department and you know, it comes over the radio, it goes, you know, city one, city one, we're, uh, you know, this is uh, ambulance, you know, you know, as you copy over, you get loud and clear. I go, coming to you, we've got a 50 year old farmer, for example, and uh, he's got a uh, loss of consciousness, drowsy, um, in your department in two minutes, which is a long time for us in recess because all our gear's set up. You know, it's a lot different when you're having a, a cardiac arrest in a community um, when you don't have the gear, but everything's set up. And sure enough, doctor to recess, doctor to recess. So I walk in, and there's this uh, man, and he's been bag masked by, um, you know, by the paramedics, and uh, he can't maintain his airway, so I have to intubate him, ventilate him, hook him up to him. Machine um, and uh, so it's breathing for him, and all his numbers are fine. You know, his ABCs, his airways, breathing and circulation. So I go, I need to scan him. Um, this was in Auckland Hospital. It was a farmer visiting Auckland. Um, and anyway, he, um, so we've got 24 hour CT. So through the CT scanner, which is about from here to the coffee machine, and this is a scan of his head. Um, and like, you don't need to be a doctor to work out that that shouldn't be there, right? So this is the skull, and this is the brain, and this is the grey matter, and uh, around here, and this is blood. So it's just hydraulics, right? We're hydraulics, and I'm um, sure you've got pumps on your farm, and especially on dairy farms. And so what's happened is he's burst a blood vessel, and he's pumped all this blood into a fixed space. And I look at that and go, oh, that's not survivable, you know? And I feel really sad because I'm not going to have to talk to the family and go and talk to the whanau and his, you know, his sister and his, his brother and his two kids and his dad there. And I said, look, it's not looking good. You know, I'm going to take him to our department of critical care. We'll ventilate him overnight and see how he is in the morning. But I know that he's already brain dead and they switched the machines off and he passes away at 50, right? So I saw three of those in one night and I thought, bugger this, I need to do something about it. So I got this old retro Chevy V8 ambulance. Um, I started travelling around the country, that's uh, heading up the Dingleburn. Um, I did tell them I was coming, um, if you know that story. And uh, so, yeah, been up there a few times, got the old Chevy V8 in there. So I've been right around the country and, and spent eight years on the road, really, and we've done over 5,000 medical checks. Um, over 50,000 people have come to our talks and there's documentaries on what we've been doing around mental health and stuff. So I just want to sort of give you a bit of a taste of what I've found, really. So, you know, thanks to Dairy and Z, I did 400 pit stop tests um, right around the country. This one's taken in the Waikato. I was the first ambassador for Farmstrong um, and they do great work. Um, when the dairy payout was $3.65, we started. I hear it was like $9.60. You guys should be Pretty happy? No? Something else is getting you down, but I hope you're putting some of it away. Because um, anyway. 
Uh, I've also um, done a few prostate checks along the way, and that was Jeremy Wells, I was on Seven Sharp, and I drove around my ambulance and people go, are you that prostate guy? I'm like, no, but I can be. And, um, <laughs> but you know, we talk about prostates. But you know, three key findings of being on the road for eight years and, and same, you know, risk awareness, people don't know their numbers. Now you know the numbers of your cows and you know, I was at a, at a Rabobank and we teaching on their program for, I don't know, about 20 years and, and um, you know, there's a guy there and he's at dinner and he's showing me the, the heat of his cows, which are, you know, fertile and you know, and he's like showing me the fecundity of, uh, I've got to say that carefully, of, um, you know, of his cows and we're sitting in Sydney and Sydney and I'm going, yeah, but what's your blood pressure made? I was like, I wouldn't have a clue, you know. Um, and people don't know what the numbers mean and we're working, I've been working in Tiana a lot recently and I've just been in the far north and you say to people, these people are on blood pressure pills, like, what's your blood pressure actually measuring? And I go, oh, I don't know. And it's not, it's, we just do a really poor job as a medical profession trying to explain what these numbers mean because if you understand what they mean, then you're going to take them more seriously, right? And the reason why that guy had the stroke because he had uncontrolled high blood pressure. He just, you know, like your pipes are only rated for certainly for a certain amount of pressure. So, you know, it's measured in millimeters of mercury. It's just like a rain gauge. So the top numbers are squeeze pressure. The bottom numbers the filling pressure. So if you're above 160, getting up to 180 millimeters of mercury, which is you know the old school GP, we pump it up and watch the mercury rise. It's like PSI or whatever. But we measure millimeters of mercury. And you see it go up, but you don't, your pipes aren't pressurated for you know, more than 180 or 200. So if you get up there, you know, you're going to burst a pipe. The other one is, and have a bleed, the other one is your heart starts to fail if it's pushing against fluid, right? And just thousands and thousands of people were picked up with high blood pressure and they don't even know. Because you, you don't know that you've got high blood pressure, it's a silent killer. The other hassle, which I'm sure, you know, Wiggy, great job you're doing out there, is people who have, you know, bits of paper. And, you know, the 400 pit stops I did for Dairy and Z is like all the bits of paper it took me like longer to put the, the data in than it did to drive through the Molesworth and um, test a whole lot of dairy farmers were on a farm tour there, you know. So I built this app, I'm just going to talk about it real briefly, but it's called Kind Know Your Numbers Dashboard. We've got three million data points and, and I'm, you know, passionate about this and, and when I started Dr Global, it's all about data. So, you know, I've been on farms when MPIs come up and told you about Bovis and go, we're going to give you a nod. I didn't know what a nod was. And saying, oh, you can't, you know, you can't move your, you know, the stress that it puts people on. And I've talked to Ray and the crew and it's like, you want data, industry data to show how mental health, and we can measure the mental health of every farmer in the country, you know, overnight, um, if you just put in some data. And then we can go and say, look what you're doing, you know, this latest legislation, what you're doing, whatever you're doing, it's really mucking around and it's causing um, mental health issues, it's causing heart attacks, it's causing strokes, you know. Um, and we can identify burnout, you know, early and late. Burnout. So that was what I was told by brief was I got to talk about burnout. So better talk about burnout. <laughs> so what are some symptoms of burnout? Anyone know? What's a major what's probably one of your first symptoms? A symptom is something that you feel, right? As opposed to a sign, which is something that you see. So anyone, what what, what do you think some uh, if, if you if your staff are burning out or you're burning out or your partner's burning out, what do you think some of the symptoms or, or signs are of burnout? Anyone? Fatigue. Sorry? Fatigue. Fatigue, yeah, you're tired? Stop caring, you lack of like, you lose empathy, totally. Irritability, Irritability. who said that? Right, I've got a book for you, yeah. Um, uh, I'll give you one on polar bears, but anyway. Um. <laughs> because you're obviously up to the irritability, right? So irritability is one of the first symptoms of burnout. So there I was, um, you know, last week I did 100 hours as a rural GP on call, you know, and it's, it's not sustainable, but that's a whole other talk for maybe on the country or something. But, um, you know, being on call and you're in rural towns but they've got an urban expectation, you know, people come in and go, oh, I went down to the medical centre at 11 o'clock at night on Monday and there was no one there. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, we're trying to fucking sleep, excuse my language. <laughs> So 48 hours on Great Barrier Island, they were desperately short, and I go, right, I'll go and help out, because my daughter's just, you know, bought a place up there, so I'll go and help out, and I go through a lot of my boat. Um, and then I get off, you know, like, you're up, and it's, you can't kind of relax, right, because next minute, like, honestly, having a coffee, not in Great Barrier, and it's like, you've got a one-year-old unresponsive, blue, and I've got to get there, you know, and try and recess and, and all that. And so, you know, yeah, it's pretty tiring, and, and you, you know, it's hard to sleep, right? So I was a bit irritable. So I turned up last night, where's Colin, is he here? Colin, put your hand up, mate. Right, come on, get up here, mate. Come on, I want to see you. So uh, Colin uh, from FIL um, said, oh, what are you doing? And I'm like, I've got a book for you, mate. So Colin says, what are you talking about? Didn't know him for a bar of soap. And I went, well, healthy. He goes, you don't look very bloody healthy. <laughs> what, 
In other words, I'm fat, right? Yeah, so. so while he's coming up here, we haven't rehearsed this, but he's looking a bit nervous. Colin holds the position of nails. I did a bit of stalking, Colin, right? Because I thought you too. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. What'd you, you find? Left, you've left an elite athlete out of your bio today. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously an overweight one, but I let myself go. <laughs> Starting off in Taranaki, whereabouts in Taranaki? Uh, Waitra. Oh, Waitra, you know, from Okado. Yeah, 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 there you go. Anyway, in the agriculture industry, 40 years ago, same, I was in Waitra, I used to be a GP in Waitara. Um, Colin worked for Ecolab, blah, blah. Um, with his extensive knowledge of the domestic and international dairy sector, Colin leads a strong team of 19 area managers across the country. That'd be a stressful job. With his vast experience and passion for industry, Colin tackles all opportunities head on. That's why I've got you up here, Colin. So <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, you put it on your bio, mate. Let's give you an opportunity. Call me fat. Um, <laughs> Over the last four years, he has extended his skill set to include a focus on mastitis prevention and lowering SCC on farm. Now, I know what mastitis is. I've probably seen a little bit different kind of mastitis than you see. Probably um, more exciting for you. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, People are in pain and suffering, yeah, we won't go there. Um, so what's SCC? Because in my language, that's a squamous cell carcinoma. Somatic cell count. Oh, somatic cell count, all right. Okay, well, that, I can make sense of that. I've got an honours degree in molecular genetics as well. We won't go into that. Um, somatic is from the body, right? So how many, so, soma is body, that's what it means, right? So mm -hmm. you're measuring what, what's somatic, like how does it, what are you measuring, what sort of cells are they? White blood cells shedding a cell tissue. All right, so white, white blood cells, okay, blood cool, cells. yeah. It's also squamous cell carcinoma. Do you want a skin check? What do you want, skin check, prostate check? <laughs> I'm gonna take a little bit longer than I need to because you're well, giving you're me shit last night. <laughs> no, no, but now I'll get to serious now, okay. So I'm big on knowing your numbers, so you know your SC. So what's, what's, a, what's, a, what's a normal range for a, a somatic you know, cell count in a cow? You know, what, what's a normal white cell count in a cow? Presumably that's what you're measuring, blood? Probably a normal one's around 100,000. 100,000 cells, right, yep. What's your blood pressure? The actual numbers. It was good the other day, but I can't tell you the number. Well, that's my whole point, right? So what's good? You know, do you turn up and do the farmers go, um, how's my somatic cell count? And you go, well, it's good. You know, you'll, you'll say it's like 200,000, which is a little bit up, so it could be mastitis. Need a few chemicals for your antibiotic. Yeah. Get my point? Okay, so go home, find out. Because some GPs will go, oh, yeah, it's good, but it's like it's 160. I've done ones where, and people have gone uh, 200 over 100, and then they go, oh, my GP said it was good. It's been sitting at 180 for like ever, you know? Not slagging off my colleagues, but what's good, right? There's some, some GPs will treat, some people won't. What's your PSA? Not the thing that affects kiwi fruit, right? Um, the prostatic spe specific, specific antigen. Don't know. Right, so you're over 50, obviously, if you started 40 years ago, otherwise you'd have been 10 when you got yeah. your first job. Oh, I was young. Yeah, 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 I can tell. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you look at yeah. So your PSA it measures your prostate, right? It's prostatic specific antigen, only found in the prostate, right? So, you know, you want to know, it wants to be below five, and, and I, you know, I used to have my own radio show and I'm right for the Sunday Star Times, and I'm just passionate about people getting there, and you need both the DRE, your oil check, the, the digital rectal examination, and um, because 5% of cancers you'll miss if you don't do the finger. So I saw someone recently, he's put it up on Facebook, and, you know, normal PSA and do a rectal, and I found a nodule, and I'm like, mate, that doesn't feel right, and he's, you know, prostate cancer, he's had it removed, and he's probably going to do well and survive, you know, but you know, we talked a bit about this last night, but some of your GPs go, oh, don't worry about it, right? Or don't check it? Yeah, a lot of GPs aren't keen on using the finger. Yeah, I know, I reckon it's laziness, yeah. right? I'm going to say that, yeah. and you can record it, and uh, you know, but you save lives, you know, and a urologist will back me up, plumbers, fancy word for plumbers. So, <laughs> it's true, I work in Auckland Hospital, I ring, I was at the plumber, and they're like, what? I'm the, I'm the urology registrar, you know, and I'm like, you know, no, mate, you're a plumber, um, orthopedics are carpenters, and urologists are electricians, right? Keep it simple. So. PSA, um, and that measures, so you want to get your blood test first because if someone does the DRE and then they massage the prostate, so that can go up. So, you know, go back. We, we, oh, you live in Hamilton now, right? Yeah? Mm. yeah, yeah. So go and see your GP. You want to know what your blood pressure is. Get a PSA done. What's your cholesterol? It's always been good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Can't well, it might not be now. <laughs> yeah, so that, well, that's, why now. that's why I've developed the app, like, Know Your Numbers Dashboard, because they're your numbers, right? They're not your GP's numbers. It's not, it's not him that's going to be riddled with prostate cancer. And I've got so many letters from people going, I can't believe, you know, like, my GP didn't check it, and now I've got riddled with bone cancer and all that, you know? It's, it's wrong. And so they're your numbers. 
anything else I can help you with? So blood pressure, HbA1c, not many much diabetes and, and farming, type 2 diabetes. Anything else, any other consult? What, what about your mental health, how's that? You measure, I'll give you a free, a free access to my app. I was good until I was up here. No, no, you're doing well. No, you're doing well. Thanks for coming up. I got your book. Um, I better move on. But, um, but you get my point, right? So, and I think it's just, I say this so many times, and it's just, know your numbers, mate. There's a book on stress, um, Healthy Thinking. I wrote it. And um, yeah, we do a bit of fishing, so come out and uh, we'll go fishing. We'll see and you on the boat, mate. See you on the boat, yeah, for sure. Okay. All right, thank big round for Colin, you know? But you know, go home and get this stuff checked, right? Otherwise, it's just a bit of a yarn, you know? So look, you're more likely to look after your staff, your stock, your plant, your machinery, your trucks, rather than yourselves. You know, Colin's looking after cows. Colin, before you go, how many times do you recommend people get their SCCs and their cows um, measured a year? Done every day, mate. Oh, is it in the milk? Yeah. Oh, right, okay, I thought you were doing a blood test. All right, well, we do blood tests, right? So, um, in the blood, how many times do you get your cows tested every year for blood tests? Once. Once. Some people are four, right? But when did you last have a blood test? <laughs> a month ago. Month ago? Well, good. That's good. But what, what, and people go, oh, I got tested everything. It's like, what are they testing, right? And there's lots of apps you can get and then manage my health, other ones. Look at your numbers, know what they are, take responsibility for them and for your loved ones as well, right? There you go, like your prize bull, you'd probably look after, I know that's not a cow, um, but um, you'd look after that more. And uh, I know you don't have like horses too much on farms, um, but uh, there's a story behind that. So changing tack a little bit, this is a bit of a sort of very sad story. So, you know, a certain farmer died, I'm gonna put him up here shortly, and the family said, what can we do at the funeral? We could donate for this, donate for that. So we wanna raise some money for Dr. Tom's ambulance. And I thought, what's the best thing I can do? I can put gas in, you know? <laughs> I want to drive it now because it's so thirsty, you know. But the but the point is, I thought I'll, I'll do a story on his life, and it's on our on our Facebook page. And I went and visited his family and his farm. And he was like 54, and he you know died of it on farm, shoeing his horse, you know. And uh, Mark Crane, you know, you might even know him. And um, you know, he's from Canterbury, and you know, it was a pretty sort of experience going there and talking to his family and you know it brings you to tears you talk to his dad pat and you go you know what would you say to your son now pat and he goes i'd say very proud of you mark love you but i wish you'd looked after yourself as much as your animals right and that's the kind of thing is you've got to look after yourselves and we say that so often on farms you know it's like what's the most important asset you're going to go oh the cows you know my manager this truck you know my wife whatever but it's you the farmer right so look after yourself know your numbers and uh, you don't want to be getting like me picking you up and obviously uh Colin need to get a bigger set of overalls or lose a bit of weight. Um, I have got a bigger set of overalls, but yeah, I've been fortunate enough to be in field of working in Tiana um, for a few months and, and um, working in the rescue helicopter. But you know, here's the story, 50 year old, year old farmer felt unwell, sweating, rapid heart rate, um, atrial fibrillation, which is your heart's beating you know, in a different rhythm. Um, it's got this thing, right bundle branch plot, just putting out some flash words. A hint of ischemia, which just means a hint is like not on the ECG. So I'm going, this isn't right. Um, thinned his blood, you know, phoned Dunedin Hospital, trip in the helicopter, and gets to the cath lab, right? Now, um, not everyone makes it to the cath lab. About 50% of people die, um, and they don't get to the cath lab. So this is what uh, his angiogram looked like, so keeping it simple. So, you know, this is uh, narrowing here like a pinhole and this is where you inject dye and here's this so very little blood coming through here this is the heart right so if you get a clot there you're dehydrated um, you, you know you haven't that much to drink you're stressed boom clot all this part of your uh, heart dies and you, you won't make it at your cath lab right luckily a little bit of blood trickling through there so fortunately they put a stent in and uh, put in a, um, a pipe opens up the place just plumbing right you must get your pumps blocked on your farm where well, there's only just a very small little arteries or pipes servicing your heart so stent in boom now we've got nice blood supply and that's the thing i hear the most and same heard about mark crane i can't believe he died he was so fit and healthy like he looked like colin right he looked you know he's fit and healthy um, but you can't judge a book by its cover so and, and i'm sure wiggy will find that you people turn up a lot like me i'm overweight and you go oh, should he be a train wreck but you know i know my cholesterol is good um it's not good you know it's like 4.6 uh, my blood pressure is 120 on 80 my psa is like 0.05 so i know my numbers and on the outside sure i probably i do, definitely do need to um, get down again to 100 kilos but um it's uh you know but on the inside i'm doing okay 
So go and get that checked, you know, get a plumbing problem checked. Uh, if your heart stops, it's a plumbing problem or an electrical problem. So moving on to electricity. So we, we measure anxiety, depression and stress. There's a thing called Takotsuba syndrome, which is broken heart syndrome. Um, and what happens is um, we seen, saw a lot of that in Christchurch earthquake, probably when the dairy payout was $3.65 and then you get a letter from MPI about bovis on top or whatever. Um, you know, your heart goes into this fatal rhythm um, and broken heart syndrome. So stress, anxiety, depression, sleep, all these things affect our heart. So you're more likely that your heart's going to stop from an electrical problem, right? So it's really important that we manage our mental health and our stress level and our burnout, because what happens is our cardiovascular system burns out, right, and your heart stops. So for the men in the audience, it's not if or but when we're going to get heart problems, right? So I've had angiograms and, you know, like I check this stuff because I just see every day what happens to people that don't get it checked and get sorted, right? So if you've got chest pain like this, or if you're walking up a hill and you're going, shit, I'm unfit, it may not be unfit, right? You might have a narrowing in your artery, especially if, you're, um, if you've got a family history of heart disease, right? Right, what's next? So look, my whole mantra is, you know, if you measure it, you can manage it. And I saw that on Dave Dudunsky's cow shed in Fortuna Farms in Southland. And I was there doing something, oh, if you measure it, you can manage it. So what I've been doing for the last, you know, eight years is measuring stuff. And this is metadata from, um, and if I, on payout, I'll probably show that, like, you know, anxiety, like 50% of people got anxiety, but that's actually real estate data at the moment. Like four months ago, when I looked at that, right, uh, maybe not in the rural sector, because that's holding strong, but, um, you know, because you've got some money to spend on um, at the moment on um, properties, but uh, certainly in urban, uh, nothing's moving, right? So measure, monitor, yeah, measure, monitor, monitor, and act. Do something about it once you get the data, right? If you find 30% of your staff are stressed or whatever, do something about it. Or, don't, or have low financial security. So you measure all this stuff. So a little bit of a testimony from Reese. There's Reese here from Alliance Farms. So, um, you know, basically they've used kind and, um, you know, you use it, you get the data, like you get data on anything else on your farm and you do something about it, right? If you've got low, whatever, potassium, in your soil, or um, selenium or something, or your um, SCC is too high, you do something about it, right? So get the data, do something about it. Basically, kind's a triage system, and what we do is look for, you know, when I work in the emergency department, I just look at your vital signs. I look at your pulse, your blood pressure, respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, um, and uh, I go, I need to intubate you, ventilate you, call your family, take you to recess, or you're going to intubate, ventilate someone else who's got a worse triage score, or I've got time to go to the CAF and get a coffee and update my Facebook status, which is never. So it's the same with this, right? How many people, how many of your staff have got sleep apnea in a safety critical role? Do you have it, right? Sleep apnea is massive. Untreated sleep apnea, three times more likely to have a workplace accident, four times more likely to have a motor vehicle accident. I took that photo in the North Island, uh, not because I'm rubbernecking, because I'm a doctor for St John, and I was in my own ambulance, it'd be a bit rude if I just drove past. Um, and uh, so I stopped, and that was a photo. And um, I did forestry when I left school, um, before I went to medicine. And um, I showed that at a conference, um, must have been just before lockdown, when we were having conferences, and the guy goes, that's actually my truck. And, um, but you know, like 90% of um, accidents are due to the, the person, not the vehicle, right? And we spend all this money, and we should do on making sure our vehicles are safe, but what about ourselves being safe, right? How are we going for time? Sort of just, it was a loose start time. There's my phone, it's all right. 9.40, all right, 20 minutes. Thanks very much. So I'm just carrying on about burnout because it's important, and, you know, but I want to give you a physiological sort of neurophysiological thing about burnout. So this is what a nerve cell looks like, right? It's an axon, you know, looks like our hand. It's got these things called dendrites. So we've got 300 billion of these things going on in our brain. They all connect through networks just like roads to other nerve cells. So that gives us 10 trillion networks in our brain. So if you're going to wake up every morning or whatever it was you know, eight years ago when we started to pay out $3.65 or bloody MPI want me to do this or, you know, like... I'm not saying you should ignore that stuff, but we're sending a discharge down the, down the grumpy unit to our amygdala, which is our alarm center. So we put our cortisol up, we put on weight, we put our blood pressure up. But if you wake up every morning and are grateful for something, like, you know, I've got the best job in the world, um, I uh, live in a great place, you know, I love my cows, you know, I love my wife, love my kids, 
Hopefully they love you. Um, you know, but when you're grateful, you're going down a different pathway. And you can, you can change the shape of your brain by changing what you think. It's called neuroplasticity. So gratitude's a really important thing. Um, and we, can, we focus on a lot of the negative stuff, but um, it's important to be grateful. However, if you're working long hours, and I've seen that in the dairy industry um, when I was doing the pit stop checks, you know, um, see people like, uh, how long, one of the questions from memory was, how long when you had three consecutive days off farm? So I'm asking that in November, and they'd go, oh, June? I'm like, okay, what'd you do? I went, went to field days. <laughs> I'm like, you know, <laughs> but the hours you guys are work sometimes, especially the younger ones, uh, might be older ones if you know when it was 365. Um, but you know, the hours are like, well, we work in ED and you burn out. So you can't tell someone, I can't tell a dairy worker who's working you know, twice a day and doing everything else and up at you know, four and home, at, you know, just can't get to sleep and got sleep problems. That's what burnout looks like. These are neurotransmitters, by the way, I didn't explain that. It could be anything, couldn't they? Dots, they could be somatic cell counts, really. Um, but in the milk, I don't know what these are. Cups, they could be cups, but these are nerve cells, right? So this is dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and that's what, we can't measure this in a blood test because it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So, um, but this is what a nice, healthy, um, but the electrical signal clicks through here. But if you're working, you know, long hours, and you know, like me, I'm close to burnout, I know, because I'm getting irritable and shitty, you know, and, and um, yesterday when they asked me to take my blundstones off at the Wellington, you know, security thing, I'm like, mate, like, I didn't have to take them off in Auckland, you know, like, why do I have to do it now, you know, and he's like, because Auckland's got a different machine, they're getting a new machine, you'll have to take them off there too soon, maybe not in that voice. I'm like, fuck, I would have thought they'd get a machine where you didn't have to take them off anyway. So, burnout's really important. Like, so I do a little software hardware check, or I can check it on my app, and I go, if I'm shitty, and I go, have I enough sleep? No, I haven't. Have I had enough um, um, affection? Probably not. Um, had enough surfing? No, you know. Um, so I know my hardware's getting rattled, and I know I'm measuring on my app that I'm close to burnout, right? So I can probably go another 48 hours of this, I'm gonna go to Rotorua tonight, but I'm going to Fiji on Saturday, because I need to sit by a pool and just kind of chill out, and I need to go surfing, right? So, one too far, no. So, the whole point is the red part of our brain, the amygdala, is the grumpy unit. You may not know you've got a grumpy unit. You may think you've married one, or they think they've married one. <laughs> I'm trying to get into the green part, the, the nucleus accumbens. So, when we think about things, um, it sends signals to, our, to, the, to the grumpy unit, and through electrical activity, by changing what I think, I can change the signal and go to my happy place, right? Providing I haven't burned out, providing my hardware's okay. So if I'm grumpy or shitty, and I do my hardware check, and I go, it's just what I'm thinking, right? So, bit of, bit of lead up in the bio. It's always interesting when I introduce at conferences, I don't know what they're gonna say. So I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> I'd better say, mention that then, you know? Um, but I hit by a tsunami, helped out in the Boxing Day one. Um, got divorced, that's not unusual. Um, got stabbed in a home invasion. Um, nearly bled to death, not by the same person who divorced me, I should say. And uh, I had this venture capital company, Dr. Global, raised three million, and we were way, just way ahead of our time doing online consults you know, 20 years ago. And, and I still, it's just tragic, really, because what we built and what we did, and, and they call it telemedicine now, and it was just a phone call, right? I'm ringing you up and going, okay, tell me. And they, they say 70% of our consults should be online now, but it's just a phone call. It's not telemedicine at all. But anyway, don't start me on that. So, but I went to a dark place, right? So I've lost my, lost my job, lost my company, lost my family, and uh, you know, I don't have time to go into the whole story, but I got to the point that I did think of taking my own life, and, um, and yeah, and I, just my whole life changed, you know, and, and I thought I've lost everything, you know, and you get to a dark place. And I didn't for the, the reason, you know, and I got pretty serious about it, and I was put on medication, I couldn't work, I lost my empathy, and it was like four in the morning, I was working in the, I got back on the tools, and I was working in the emergency department, I remember an alcoholic coming in and thinking, and the nurse said, oh, don't scan him, you know, he's always like that, and I thought, oh yeah, if he, he dies, you know, and I thought, shit, that's a real wake up call, I didn't become a doctor, because I've lost, you know, so I figured there was something wrong, this is over 20 years ago, so I went along and, and, and took some time off, and had to go to the medical council, and they patted me on the hand, said, don't worry dear, what we find is, Doctors who um, say they're struggling and report things um, do really well. It's those that hide it that don't, right? And so I started talking about depression, you know, over 20 years ago, before JK and Mike King, who I know really well. And I got to, you know, taking my own life and I sat there and I thought about it. I thought, I can't because 
when I was at med school, I did a study, I was doing post-mortems, just that's what I was doing, and then I saw about eight people in a row that had taken their own life, and that was in Canterbury, and um, at Christchurch Hospital. So I was just a med student, but I went and did a study and wrote, is suicide predictable or preventable? And what I found was a third of people had a diagnosis of depression. I looked at all the suicides in Canterbury from 1977 to 1987, and that's a long time ago, and I'm sure it hasn't changed much. The only thing that's changed that probably influences social media. But anyway, what I found was a third were depressed, a third had sudden loss, like loss of relationship, loss of finance, loss of self-esteem, loss of um, a perceived future. And I had kind of all of those. Um, a third had other mental health issues and 10% I just couldn't work out why. But what really haunted me and what makes me keep doing this and doing this, even though sometimes I go, maybe I should just go surf and look after myself more, is that um, I spoke to this 15 year old boy and said, was there any warning your dad was gonna take his own life? And he goes, nah, he got lost his job, he got made redundant. For two years he stopped listening to music and stuff and we knew he was suffering, we knew he was in pain, but we never ever thought he'd take his own life. But he said, Dr. Tom, I was Dr. Tom there, wasn't there, I was just Tom. He goes, um, I was a student, but he goes, when dad took his own life, he didn't take his pain away, he just gave it to us, right? And we all know people that have taken their own life. So I thought, I can't do that to my kids. I need to figure out, I need to sort myself out. You know, if I'm a doctor, I should be able to figure it out, right? But they don't teach you this stuff at med school. So when he basically, I discovered healthy thinking, and that's when I thought, this is the key to it. So I went from being suicidal in my garage, doing stand-up comedy in a six-week period. I wouldn't recommend that as a therapeutic option, you know? <laughs> But you can't make this stuff up. So I go to the classic comedy bar in Auckland. I'm from Taranaki. I'm like, Tom, will do some comedy. Sure. So I turned up. Raw comedy night. It was pretty raw. And the MC was Mike King. Well, this is the year 2000, right? It was a lot different Mike King, I can tell you, then than it is now, right? Um, so that was a bit of an experience. And then I thought, look, it's just the way I'm looking at things. It's my perspective that's different, right? So I thought, well, my wife's left. I might as well go and let's take the kids. We'll go and work on the Chatham Islands. So that's me doing a house call on the Chathams. And then I was sitting on my boat one day, I got a boat, as you do, <laughs> when you get divorced, or you get it before, then you get divorced, get the boat, and then, um, so I thought, oh, do you get out on your boat much? And I'm like, no, not enough, I'll do the hop tour, Healthy Oceans, People and Port, so it's a nice kingy up in uh, spearfishing, and then um, got the Ambo, and uh, circumnavigated New Zealand on the boat, doing house calls with the Ambo on the boat, and I uh, just got more into surfing. There's that one, there's for you, Colin, just show that full of figured people can still catch waves, mate. <laughs> Uh, serving for farmers, what a great initiative. And what's great about that, it ticks all those well-being boxes, you know, it's like, you know, um, you know, you get off the farm, you're doing connecting, you're exercising, you're learning new things. And a great mate of mine, Pete Northcott, you might know if he's a dairy farmer in Taranaki, and he just surfs all the time, always does. And people go, his farm looks, must look like shit, you know. He's always surfing, but his face got the most immaculate farms. He sold them now, he's 75, and he's still surfing waves like that. And I said, isn't the surfing for farmers so great? And he goes, well, it took them so long to work it out. He's been doing it since he's about 10, you know. Right, it must be getting close to the end. So i just give you some tools quickly, software, sadness, anger, resentment, disappointment. If you're not sad or angry now, you might, it's, uh, you know, it used to be payout 365, it's probably legislation now you're battling with or the perception of you know, rural folk when you're trying so hard and you're feeding the world. But if you're not stressed or angry right now, the only way you're going to get stressed or angry is to think of something. Now that says think of something, it's rejuggled because it's not my computer, so I'm not stressed about that. It's just interesting the way it's jumbled, right? You know, I find everything interesting. Human behaviour is interesting instead of stressful. So here's the wiring diagram of, of, our, um, of our heads. Here's my phone. Vodafone's, oh, so I've got plenty of time. Um, so a trigger, whatever it is, dairy payout, I keep coming back to that, thought, um, emotion creates an action or a, a consequence or a benefit. So when I was divorced, you know, like I was trigger was getting divorced, thought was, oh no, I'm a failure, what's the emotion, sadness, what's the action, I'm just going to sit around and feel sorry for myself, what's the consequence or benefit, less people ring me up, you know, become more and more socially isolated, trigger is it shows I don't have any friends, thought is, you know, I'm actually... I'm a burden to my family, you know? And then what's the emotion? Deeper sadness, I'm better off, they're better off without me. Like, if you get to that dark place, you need help, right? And then it's like, that, but because you, your brain's not working, you know, I was burnt out as well. And it's interesting, you know, I was worried what the medical profession would say to me, because, you know, I'm a rural kind of GP, ED doctor, and they, they actually invited me to become an honorary lecturer in psychological medicine at the University of Auckland, just because of the data I was gathering and, and out there doing talks like this, you know? rather than waiting for you to come in. Um, so same, same trigger, divorce, changed my thoughts. I haven't met the most amazing woman in the world yet. Like the mother of my children is still amazing, right? But just didn't work, she didn't like traveling, I do. Anyway, 
emotion is excitement. So what's the action? I'll try internet dating in, um, 20 years ago. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to date someone from Waitara or Rahudu, you know. I might as well go to Spain. It's in the book. You can read about that um, column. But, um, and so the action was I went to Spain on an internet date. So there's been plenty of consequences and benefits of that kind of, you know. But <laughs> why not? Why sit around and be miserable? Might as well get out there. Thoughts are not facts, right? So I do this whole thing called tweaking because 90% of the thoughts we have aren't true, right? And they're not worth it and they don't help us achieve a goal. So I spent the last 20 years just refining this thinking. It's just, it's like fertilizer for the mind, healthy thinking, but it doesn't work if you don't use it. Like my kids go, Dad, you're stressed? Just read your book. <laughs> <laughs> right, I thought I'd throw this in because I saw Katrina last night. Lovely to see Katrina. So I do some stuff around the difference between the way, the way men and women think, right? And yes, men do think. Um, we do. We don't have as many thoughts as women. That's a scientific fact. We've measured them. Women have far more thoughts than us. We have a very small number of thoughts, right? I just clash it. One goes, what, what pisses you off? And they go, I asked my other husband the other day, what was he thinking? And he said, nothing. It's like, I oh, know, yeah. That pisses them off, right? And I'm like, why? It says, oh, he's thinking something dodgy, you know, like he's, he's buying a boat. He's selling a boat, you know? And the guy said to the husband, I said, what? He says, no, I was thinking of nothing. You know, we've got a nothing center in our brain, right? <laughs> we just sit there and go, well, your footy's on. What are you thinking? Nothing. You know, like, thinking the footy's on. I don't want to get into a discussion, you know. So I said, what makes you so pissed off about your husband thinking nothing? And she goes, this is in Katrina, by the way. We're coming to her example. And uh, they go, how dare he think of nothing? <laughs> you know, like, I've got to get the kids to school. I've got to organize the sheer milkers. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. So if you can't manage your own database, <laughs> what are you worried about other people? Anyway. So back to, I love Katrina and her, her example. Um, so we did this one, didn't we? We haven't rehearsed this, where is Katrina? Where's your hat? Oh yeah, you're down the back. So we were in Invercargill, good mate of mine used to run the, you know, the Ascot, Pete Bridsdale, you know, and ended up getting motor neuron disease and passed away. If I'm having a real shit day or whatever, any day, I just pour old finger Pete, he'd love to have my GST bill, right? He'd love to be here. So um, I see a lot of that in my job and it makes me feel grateful. So, trigger, thought, emotion. So, the trigger, Katrina yelled it out, and I forgive me, it's a while since I've just remembered the story because I saw it last night. The trigger was her husband dropped a, dropped a telephone pole, no, no, a post on her leg and broke it. What's the thought? He's a bleep, and I shouldn't have married him. You know, the emotion's anger, you know, action, consequence, benefit. But the story was, so, the difference between the way men and women think. So, he got this, and it wasn't a post, it was a whole telegraph pole, wasn't it? Like, dropped it off the front of the tractor onto your leg and broke it and didn't get out of the tractor, and didn't take you to hospital, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I imagine Katrina going to all her mates after she's had the, the, all the plates put in and the carpentry done, going, can't believe he did that, can't believe he never got out of the tractor. Oh, that's, well, I just can't believe that, right? Whereas us men, he'd probably go, and I'm like, no, he did that, but I remember saying that, he'd go and say, go down the pub or and go, can't believe she stood in front of the tractor, you know? Like. <laughs> She wrote the health and safety policy for the farm, which she did, right? Said, no standing in front of unsecured loads, and suddenly it's my fault. <laughs> I can't believe that either. Fuck you, tell them. <laughs> That's the lighter side. I'm glad, glad you were okay, right? But that could have turned out a lot worse, right? So, you know, it's trying to balance a bit of humour with Sirius. All right, Sirius, Dan, and they're getting close. I'm starting to think I'm, uh, I'm all right. I was told 10, right? I'm all right? Yeah, you're good. Good, sweet. Yeah. Cool. Okay. We moan a lot, um, the uh, no moan zone, I'm trying to create no moan zones, and you, you can identify doom merchants, they're addicted to being miserable, and you go, have a nice day, and I go, sorry, I've made other plans, you know, like it's like, so the spin doctors, what's the best thing to have me today, say that to your kids, I build all this stuff online, you can go to my website, drtomonamission.com, um, and uh, you can do these online training, and you can, you can train yourself how to think in a healthy way. All right, winding it up, let's have a challenge. I want you to think, what's your expiry date, right? How old do you want to live to, right? I want to think of three things that's going to get you, stop you getting there, right? What are three things? What's the age you want to live to? Three things are going to stop you getting there. Right. Everyone thought, well, if I had more time, I'd get a few bit of audience part of I suppose. Did that in Marsden, right? The first three people said, getting shot. And I'm like, didn't realise that dangerous in the wire wrapper, but um, <laughs> they're hunting, right? Before the tourists stopped coming to Milford and Tiana, it was road trauma, right? Because 800,000 people going to Milford all the time. Right, let's get everyone to stand up, please. 
So what is this thing called the attitude health game? It's not your cholesterol or your prostate that's going to kill you, it's your attitude towards it that will. Right, so what I'm going to do is ask a series of questions and I'm going to ask you to sit down. These are risk factors, right? So does everyone want to live to 80? Say yes, because otherwise we won't get out of here and miss my plane. So what that means, though, that's the average, right, roughly? So that means half of us aren't going to live to 80. Sobering thought. Look at your neighbour. Could be someone you love. Who's not going to live to 80, right? Half of us aren't going to get there because that's the average, roughly, but more for women because they go to the doctor more often, right? It's one of the reasons. So let's find out who's going to go first. Let's go and find out. And just because I ask you to sit down early doesn't mean you will die before the age of 80, right? <laughs> I don't want you to go, oh, my God, Dr. Tom says I'm going to die. I might as well keep just doing what I'm doing, right? So sit down if you uh, snore. So that's about a third of the audience, right? Yeah, yeah. That's how someone said, uh, if you're a liar, if you stand out, well, you prefer economical with the truth. Yeah, yeah. So sit down if you're economical with the truth. All right, so like, the, the thing is, if you've got sleep apnea, you're more likely to die, as I said before, right? So a third of people who have sat down are likely to have sleep apnea. Um, if you've been tested for sleep apnea, that's how they measure it, manage it. You can stand back up and you don't have it. You can, you can, if you've been tested, like me, I, I snore, but I don't have occasionally, but I don't have sleep apnea. Awesome. If you've, if you've been tested and you do have sleep apnea and you use one of those CPAP machines, you can stand back up. Has anyone got a CPAP who wants to say? Okay. Well, those of you sit down, you can, on the app, unfortunately this, the app's not free, I spent three million bucks building it, right, so I'd love to just, yeah, it's free, and sell my, sell my other kidney, but um, the point is, you, uh, you know, you can, you can test the stuff, and there's a whole lot of other screening questions, but I said that to someone, everyone goes, I can't believe how fatigued and tired it was, now you probably think I'm fatigued and tired, because it's carving, you know, because um, I'm doing this, and all the legislation, but you probably might have sleep apnea, especially if you're male, you're over 50, you've got a big neck, it doesn't have to be that, um, so I said to this guy, it made a difference, he goes, no, no, it's made my life worse, that CPAP machine. I said, why is that? And he said, oh, it's a real passion killer, um, that sleep apnea, you know. And uh, I said, um, why is that? And I said, maybe you should just try making love while you're awake, you know. <laughs> All right, I realise I've just got five minutes to go. Sit down if you don't know what your blood pressure is or that top number's more than 140. Okay, go and get your blood pressure checked. Sit down if you haven't had three days off the farm continuously in the last six months. Jesus, go, go surfing, get a holiday. All right. <laughs> Sit down if you don't exercise more than three times a week for 40 minutes. All right, we're getting there. Sit down if you um, still get sunburnt. Yeah. <laughs> get your food. All right, sit down if you had unprotected sex with somebody you don't know in the last month. <laughs> oh, good on you. I don't mind the someone you don't know, but, but you should use protection, you know. Like. <laughs> Fastest rate of sexually transmitted diseases in the world is in rest homes, you know. <laughs> All right, two minutes. Are you okay? Doesn't work. Um, I said to my daughter the other day, you know, we're, we're talking to the Antarctic, are you okay? And she goes, yeah, I'm okay. Did her kind score and she's got stress, anxiety, depression. I said, what the hell? She goes, no, nah, Dad, it's... So I looked at her sense of purpose, no sense of purpose, strongly disagree. I said, look, what's one thing that's going to get you a sense of purpose? She's on a rescue dog. Got a border collie, so there you go. Dog was a bit feral. Um, then she met a farmer who's got a border collie. She's married a farmer. She's just got a new hunt away, you know. And um, she said to me, and it's true, if you take your teenager, which was 21 at the time, to, to the doctor, you might get some antidepressants. You can sit down now, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, done that before. Um, and um, take your clothes off in a medical examination for a proper thing, I get called to a recess, and I forget to go back, and this poor old guy's still standing there like an hour later, you know. Anyway. So, married a farmer, and, uh, and she said, if I'd gone to the GP, I might have got a script for antidepressants, appointed for counselling, and all I needed was a border collie, right? So, mental health's really important, and she runs the app company now. Um, look, the last thing message is, look after yourself, like you're the prize bull, the best breeding cow, know your numbers, the ones you love, and the ones you employ as well. And um, that's my email. If you want to know more, there's my website. It's been cut off. That's all right, drtomonemission.com. And if you really want time off farm, here's a final plug. Um, we're off to uh, do some work in some villages. You don't have to be a doctor, but we're heading up to Indonesia in October. Should have finished carving by then. And uh, just come and uh, sit and relax and go swimming with whale sharks and uh, put some gas in the tank. All right, hey, look, it's great to be here. We'd love to spend more time, but I've got to get to Rotorua and then to Fiji, as long as I don't get bloody COVID beforehand. Didn't talk about COVID much, did I? Just as well. 
Hope you're vaccinated. It's insurance, right? But we won't go into that just as I'm leaving. All right, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day. Go and get your numbers checked. Thank you.